army that was invading and had besieged Jerusalem. He also became deathly ill, and he prayed to the Lord. And he was a praying king. He was a man of great reformation in the land and instituting temple worship and sacrificial system and the Levites and the priests and tearing down the, the idols, the altars to the false gods. Hezekiah was tremendously used of the Lord and God kept the Babylonians from coming for uh, many more years as a result of the reforms and the revival that Hezekiah led. Of course, he was afflicted by pride even as he came out of the, the illness and as God delivered them from the Assyrians and he was showing off the treasures of the temple and all that God had blessed him with and he was exalted in his pride even after a great victory that only the Lord could have done and he humbled himself thankfully and God did extend his life 15 years and then it, and then postponed the judgment the Babylonian captivity uh, for many more years and Hezekiah was was thankful for that several several weeks ago I should say Several weeks ago, we looked at a revival under King Josiah, but tonight, though it's not necessarily identified by most people as a revival, it is nevertheless a revival or a repentance by a group of people, and it was Cornelius and his family, his the people that were there in his household who got saved in this account in Acts chapter number 10, that really was the launching pad for the ministry that the apostles and specifically Saul and Paul would have to the Gentiles. Cornelius is often recognized as the first New Testament Gentile convert. Now, we can argue about whether other Gentiles got <laughs> saved. I mean, the wise men were probably Gentiles that uh, got saved uh, as they came and they worshiped Christ as an infant. Uh, we can get into all kinds of particulars, but this was obviously a very um, determinative uh, time in the growth of the church, the New Testament church, obviously in the church age where we have a Gentile and his household getting saved. This is a revival that began with a small group, a household of believers. And then we see, obviously, after uh, Saul is converted, becomes the Apostle Paul, we see him taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And this really is the beginning of a transition period where it's not so much a Jewish-centric focus of the gospel and the Jews then going from there, it really becomes a Gentile-centric focus of the gospel at the same time, reaching the Jews. But we as Gentiles, I could be wrong, I don't know, maybe somebody is a Jew in here, I just don't know of it, but we are the recipients of the gospel because of Peter, because of Paul, because of what happened with Cornelius, and in that sense, the revival that began here in Acts chapter 10 has continued in that sense, even to this day, with Gentiles coming to Christ. So that's just a little bit of introduction, and if you want to follow on the outline in the prayer list on the right-hand side there on the back, you know, you're welcome to follow along. There's a handful of blanks there, but if it helps you, we will look at, first of all, Cornelius in his home, his home. He lived in Caesarea. Acts 10, verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Now, this is not a band in the sense of the Gaither band or um, the John Philip Sousa band. Okay, we're not talking about that kind of a band. We're talking about a regiment, a band of soldiers, okay? And he is, Cornelius is appointed as a centurion to, by the Romans, to the town, to the city of Caesarea. So we'll take a quick look at Caesarea on the map, and this will help us. And I 
believe it was about, a, if, I, if I remember right, I forgot to write it down when I was doing my study, but I believe it was about 40 miles from Joppa to Caesarea. So Cornelius is up here in Caesarea. Eventually we'll see Peter in this story, and he is down here in Joppa, and he will travel up to Caesarea where Cornelius is at. Cornelius is stationed by the Romans as a centurion in this city of Caesarea there along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And then I need to go back to the right slide here. So we see Cornelius, his home is Caesarea, and we get a little background of this important city by understanding that it was a capital of the province in that region, and it was the home of the Roman governor. It was a Greek or Hellenistic style city, but it had a majority Gentile population. The Jewish community in Caesarea was the minority by a large percentage. So they had a very, very small percentage of Jews compared to the rest of the population. And the Jews often were prejudiced against, there was a bias against them, and there was, of course, with the Roman cohort, the Roman soldiers, the Roman government, the Roman rule, and then you have the Greek, the Hellenistic culture, so you have a pantheistic, pagan-centered worship, religion of the Greeks and the Romans, and then, of course, the emperor exalting himself into a godlike status, and the Jews, of course, recognizing one god, monotheistic religion, though the Judean culture, obviously not all the Jews were believers. Obviously, there were Jews there who were not a part of the, the church, had not been saved, and trusted Christ as their Messiah. There were some, uh, no doubt, that uh, came to Christ, but this was not a necessarily a Christian Jewish population, but just as a Judean population, as a group of Jews, they were not well treated in Caesarea. They were a small percentage, and they were looked down upon, and there were often conflicts. Herod the Great came in and rebuilt the city uh, in the early uh, days of the first century, latter days of the, uh, the previous century, but really in the early days of the first century, Herod the Great comes in, and Herod the Great was the Herod who persecuted, who killed the children, the male children, two years of age and under, after Jesus was born and the wise men came. Herod the Great was a scoundrel. He was Roman appointed. Herod was a very insecure governor. He was full of himself. He was very egocentric, narcissistic. He was an evil man. He was just a scoundrel. But he was very, very smart when it came to building buildings. He was an engineer of sorts in, in that day. He had brains for building things. And he had the ability to be able to organize and to get the money and to get the plans. And he would build things, and that was his claim to fame. That was his legacy, and that was also his way of trying to endear himself to the Jews because the temple that Jesus would worship in and that would, he would often preach in and the apostles would often preach and teach in in the first century was Herod's temple. Herod was always trying to appease the Romans and also keep the Jews happy. So one of the ways he tried to do that was by building, by remodeling, rebuilding the temple. And so that would make the Jews happy, so he thought. And at the same time, he wanted to keep the Romans happy. And then he had the ability to organize these building projects, and one of which was Caesarea. So again, we identified Caesarea on the map, and we'll also be looking just briefly at the little town of Joppa, which I believe, again, is about 40 miles south of Caesarea. So that's Cornelius' home. What about his life? Well, he's a centurion. 
verse number one says, of the band called the Italian band. So he was of the Italian regiment. He had been a, he was a Roman centurion who had been appointed to Caesarea. And the Italian regiment was probably because of the Roman governor uh, living there, making his home there. And so there would be the association with Italy, Rome, and there would be a particular exclusive group of soldiers who would be uh, appointed to this area. And Cornelius was in charge of them. He was the centurion. So a real quick background on the Roman army. Legions of the Roman army were 6,000 soldiers each. Now, I guess that there were some legions in some exceptional cases that were only 1,000 soldiers. But for the most part, as a general rule, a legion in the Roman army was 6,000 soldiers. They were then divided into cohorts of 600 soldiers each, and a centurion commanded 100 men. Century, 100. Centurion, 100 men. Centurions were reliable Steady commanders. They were not loose, immature soldiers, just out for an adventure. I mean, this, this would be the, the, the Marines, right? The, the, the Rangers. This would be the, the, the more elite group. They were ones who often earned their rank through skill, through battlefield performance. So they often earned this responsibility as centurions through their work, through their effort, through their skill, through their ability to lead and command, and through their battlefield performance. They were the cream of the crop, so to speak. They had to have a level head. They had to have a steady hand. They had to have maturity to be able to lead and to be able to keep their cool on the battlefield, and to handle, all, obviously, the, the, the different uh, things that would come up in the army and with the Romans and with the soldiers. And it's interesting, in other passages, Acts 27, Matthew 8, Luke 7, where other centurions are referenced, they're all referenced in a way that is positive, that in those cases, the centurions were spoken well of. Uh, in uh, the inspired word of God. So centurions were, from what we gather, well-respected for the most part. And we know that one of those centurions got saved at the cross, who, when he looked up, he said, truly, this must be the Son of God. I believe that centurion got saved. I believe he trusted Christ. We have a video from the Creation Museum. I believe it's called The Last Adam. It's about 10 minutes long, and it is the theme of that video is the centurion who accepts Christ. And I believe the, the uh, Creation Museum still shows The Last Adam at the, near the end, or you can just watch it in the, one of the, the, uh, the theaters there at the Creation Museum. It's a powerful video, about 10 minutes long, declares the gospel, but it's, it's themed around the, the centurion. But it's, a, it's very well done. But notice that he was an unsaved man. But he was very religious. Now we are in our culture, we are seeing a, a drift, an avalanche of people avalanching, drifting away from organized religion. It's sad. It's very sad because one of the ways we're losing meaning in our society and purpose in life is because faith, and I'm not saying that there's other faiths, I'm saying faith in a general term. I'm not talking about genuine, true Christianity. Okay, there's only one faith that is true, and that's the biblical faith, Christianity, as, as defined according to the word of God, but I'm talking about faith in general. The faith-based groups, the religious groups, not talking about the liberal religious, not talking about the progressively or the progressive Christians, the neo-orthodox or whatever, but the 
more conservative faith-based groups, not all of which teach the true gospel, salvation by faith alone and Christ alone, but faith-based groups in the more conservative realm are actually having the most stability. And the surveys are showing it, the statistics are showing it. I know it gets buried by the legacy media, but if you listen to these conservative, biblical-based programs, I don't know if AFA or uh, the other, I forget the, the radio, the family-based radio program. I, I'm sorry, I don't listen uh, much to just uh, wave radio. I listen to mostly to podcasts. But what's, what's the, uh, the family-based radio here in Lafayette? Isn't there a, or it's broadcast from somewhere. Is it American Family? American Family Radio, thank you. Um, I haven't, I'm sorry, I haven't really tuned in much to that, but I, I've, I've heard a lot of people reference it. Uh, from what I understand, a, a biblical, gospel-centered uh, radio uh, broadcasting uh, group. Uh, I know there's, there's uh, other groups out there that have some of these surveys and some of these statistics. But where there is the most stability, the most two-parent homes, where there is actually a child birth rate that is greater than 2.1 or 2.2, 2.3, whatever it is for replacement, we do realize that if two parents only have two children, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying if two parents have two children, they only replace themselves, right? And if there's any kind of death or catastrophe or disease or whatever, then that reduces that rate of replacement. So there's not very many groups in the world that are countries even in the world that are even having children at a greater than replacement rate. So one of the things that China is struggling with right now because they had the one child rule for so many years, they are below replacement rate, so low that as their population ages, they don't have enough people working to support their communist agenda. So that's another reason why they're coming after all these other different places around the world and subverting different governments and trying different ways to get resources because they don't have enough young people, especially enough men, young men, to even be able to keep their economy going. But one of the, one of the areas, one of the, way, one of the places that we are seeing a greater than replacement rate, and we're seeing more stability, we're seeing less crime, less imprisonment, is in the faith-based groups, especially among the more conservative, with some exception because of the Muslims. And the Muslims have a greater than replacement rate, but they wouldn't fall into that conservative, they would fall into a faith-based group, but they wouldn't obviously fall into a conservative or a biblical group. Uh, but the Muslims are one exception to that. Did you hear that Minneapolis now is doing the Muslim call to prayer five times a day? They just changed the ordinance in Minneapolis, the noise ordinance, so now the Muslims can call for prayer in the early morning and late at night in Minneapolis. Unbelievable. So here's an unsaved man, very religious. And we have a culture that is drifting away from religion. We have a group of people called the nuns or the nons, not the N-U-N, but the N-O-N. They're not associated with any kind of religious group. And that's almost become a badge of honor for some people. Oh, I, you know, I, don't, I don't do that church thing. I go out into nature and I, I worship my God in, in nature. I get one with the universe, you know, or whatever. You know, there's all this talk now about, well, I don't need church. I'm not in organized religion. I just, I just worship God however I feel and the way, the way I want to. And, you know, me, me and God, we got, we got this thing going. That, that's the kind of talk you hear now. It's sad. But the people without God, without religion, without faith are the most unhappy. They have the least purpose, the, less, the least amount of meaning in their life. And here's a Cornelius who is a Roman centurion who has probably been steeped in paganism all his life. But he is referred to as devout. Verse number two, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. 
Here is a man who was unsaved, but he was deeply religious. And there's that group of people. Lafayette has hundreds of churches. There's a lot of religious people in Lafayette and West Lafayette in this area. There are still a lot of religious people in this town, in this area, in this community. But how many of them are truly born again? How many of them are truly saved or truly trusting Christ and Christ alone for their salvation? How many are like a Cornelius? Religious, devout, reverent, having a religious discipline, having some sort of religious life. And sadly, back in 2020, during the presidential election, when they were doing surveys of evangelicals, an evangelical was somebody who went to church twice in a three-month or four-month span, something like that. An evangelical. Was, the definition was so loose. It was like attending church, I think it was twice in like a two- or three-month time, time frame. Twice? An evangelical is going to church twice in three months or two months, whatever it was. That's ridiculous. But that's how they were loosely defining evangelical for sur- at least one survey in the 2020 election. But here's a man who is devout. He's reverent. He has a religious life, a religious discipline. He's God-fearing. This is a title in that day given to Gentiles who wanted to attend a synagogue or attend synagogue synagogue services and learn more about the Jewish religion. As a matter of fact, we'll, we'll read or we'll see in this passage that he is praying when the vision for him to send a messenger or to send a message to Peter down to Joppa, he is in prayer. So apparently he is on the morning, noon, and evening prayer schedule that the Jews would be on, which I believe was 9, noon, and 3, if I, if I have my times right. Uh, I think it was 9, noon, and 3 were the, the three uh, times of prayer in the, the Jewish uh, uh, prayer uh, cycle. So he was praying at the 3 o'clock hour at the evening uh, hour, if I, if I remember right, and he, is, and he sees a vision, an angel of God, and that angel of God then says, you need to send a message to Peter. He's up in Caesar, or excuse me, down in Joppa. And he has uh, the truth that you are seeking. But this tells you a little bit about Cornelius. And he was a man who gave much alms to the people. We read there in verse 2. And he, he prayed regularly. And then we see in verse 3, he saw in a vision evidently about, I said the ninth, yeah, the ninth hour, excuse me, ninth hour. So 6 a.m. would be uh, the the third hour, or let me see here, it'd be nine would be the third hour, twelfth would be the sixth, twelve, twelve noon would be the sixth hour, and the ninth hour would be three p.m. So he's in the afternoon prayer or the evening prayer time, because if the, the Jewish day would be six p.m., so it'd be from sun down to sunset to sunset, if I remember right. So six p.m. to six p.m. So the the prayer cycle would be nine a.m., noon, and then three. So the evening prayer time would be the three p.m. Again, if we're if I'm uh, understanding this correctly and from what I, I read in my study, it'd be 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and he sees this vision, and it's an angel of God. Verse 4, And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth, lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. So, can an unsaved person respond to general revelation, creation, the conscience, the inner desire of the soul? I sometimes, to keep it alliterated, call it consciousness. Creation, heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Creation can show his eternal power and Godhead. We have the conscience, which has a approval or a disapproval system. That's built in, and Romans talks about the conscience uh, leaves man without excuse. And then, of course, we have the soul, Ecclesiastes 3. God has put the world in man's heart. Eternity is in man's heart. So can the unsaved respond to general revelation? Sure, here's a man who has responded to general revelation. But does God say, does Acts chapter 10 say, Cornelius, you did it. Keep working harder. Keep trying to do some more good works, but you are well on your way to heaven. Is that what Acts 10 says? 
After all the good things that Cornelius has done, having responded to the taste of God in general revelation, God doesn't say, okay, Cornelius, because you are sincere, because you believe in a higher power, because you have a religious devotion, you've arrived or you're on your way or you're, on, you're off to a good start. You've, you've got a thousand bonus points toward heaven. And the scoreboard in the sky that nobody sees, you've got a head start on a lot of other people. Is that how he says? Is that how Acts 10 goes? No, he needed the gospel. He was a devout man. He was a religious man, but he was unsaved. He did not know Christ. He did not have the gospel. He needed the gospel. He had to receive the word of God. He had to receive the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. As Romans 10 verse 17 tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10 in verse 13. He was not saved by his devout religious efforts. His interest, can we take a minute here and just admit that his interest in the truth was the work of God? Because none of us would love Christ if he didn't first love us. And we read in John 12, verse 32, Christ says, if I be lifted up, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So we have to admit that it's ultimately God who is drawing Cornelius. Cornelius is responding to that taste of God, to that drawing of God, and he is seeking God in a religious way, in a devoted way. He has a fear of God. He's doing some good things. But he hasn't come to Christ in saving faith. He hasn't repented of his sins and put his faith and trust in Christ, in Christ alone, in Christ's finished work on the cross and resurrection. He doesn't even have that knowledge yet. He hasn't even come into an understanding of that yet. He saw that angel. He sent the message to Peter. And then what does Peter do? We don't have time to read verses 9 through 18, but we've seen Cornelius, his home. We've seen Cornelius, Cornelius his life, but now we see Cornelius his conversion. What, what was going on with Peter in verses 9 through 18? God had to prepare Peter. Peter had to be prepared. We have to be prepared. Now, Peter was in a dispensation of the Jewish, the Mosaic law. Jewish was a genuine believer. He was a saved man. He knew Christ. He was an apostle. He was a preacher of the gospel. He had already preached several times already in the book of Acts, but Peter was still thinking that it's the Jews that are going to be the true holders of the gospel. The Gentiles, they might get some crumbs, but the Jews are the ones that are the special agents of God, and the Gentiles are down here maybe licking the crumbs up from the floor on the table down below. When actually, God is going to, in a sense, flip that around, and it's going to be the Gentiles who are going to be taking the gospel to the Jews. And I know this is a little bit of a side note, but as that blanket comes down from heaven, as Peter's praying, and what God hath called clean, let no man call unclean, can I also have a little bit of a rabbit trail and say it's okay to eat meat? I'm not saying if you have a health issue and you can't eat meat, yes, there can be negative benefit or neg negative consequences to too much meat, red meat or whatever. I know that there's some things, health but can I say that Acts chapter 10 declares it's okay to have a steak? <laughs> it's okay to have a burger? It's okay to have a hot dog? God said, eat the meat. Now, it was an illustration, but he said the Mosaic law, the ceremonial law, it's over. The moral aspects of the law are still in effect. The ceremonial aspects are gone. So God said to Noah when he got off the ark, eat the meat. God said to Peter when he said to witness to the Gentiles, he said, eat the meat. And it was an illustration, and that's a little side note, it was an illustration that Peter needed to learn that what God hath called clean, the gospel is for the Gentiles as well as for the Jews. And as a matter of fact, Peter, in just a minute, there's going to be some people knocking at your door, and they are Gentiles. 
and you're going to go to a Gentile's house and you're going to eat with him. That was anathema to the Jews. No Jew goes into a Gentile's house and eats with the Gentiles. Don't you know they are the scum? Maybe they can get some crumbs off the table, but they're the dogs, they're the scavengers. They're the offscouring of the earth. And maybe God will have some pity and some mercy on the Gentiles. But they are not us, the Jews. And God dealt with Peter's pride, didn't he? And there was a knocking at the door. Peter had to be prepared. Sometimes we have to get off of ourselves and our pride in order to see the needs of others around us, don't we? In order to see people who need the gospel or people who need to be discipled or people who need to grow up in their relationship with God. And maybe we're, maybe God wants to use us, but we're too full of ourselves. Cornelius had to hear the gospel. And then I know we're just having to zip through this, and I'll just put the, whoops, I went too far. There we go. I'll just put all these up, and we'll just have a minute here to talk about this. But we get all the way down to verse 44, and the Holy Spirit fell on them. But notice in verse 43, as Peter is giving the gospel to Cornelius, wonderful sermon. I mean, it's just a, it's, it's such a great sermon. I'm not even able to really talk much about it. But verse 43, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whose name? Jesus. Whoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And then what happens? Cornelius and his household, they get saved. The Holy Spirit fell on them. They speak in tongues. The point here isn't, about tongue speaking. The point is that the Gentiles got saved and that the Holy Spirit had been given to the Gentiles just as he had given the Holy Spirit to the Jews. Same thing. Undeniable. Same manifestations of, uh, same manifestation of, uh, of gift. Tongues. Visible. And the people responded. Wow. The Holy Spirit has been given to the Gentiles? Verse 45, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. They were saved. The Holy Spirit was given to them. This is a transition time in the church. Holy Spirit was given in Acts 2. The Holy Spirit is given to the Gentiles, Acts 10. The Holy Spirit is given to the disciples of John the Baptist who weren't looking to Jesus. And they are also able to speak in tongues. And those are three references in the transition of the church where every group of people who trust Christ as their Savior, are given the Holy Spirit. We know from 1 Corinthians 14, we know from 1 Corinthians 13, that, and from the historical record, that tongues is not a gift, an active gift of today. I'm a cessationist. I believe that tongues was a gift for unbelieving Jews for a certain period of time as a sign gift during the time that the Bible was being written and for a sign to the unbelieving Jews that the Holy Spirit is given to all believers upon their trust in Christ as their Savior. And that's the point. Tongues were indicative of the fact that God deals with Jews and Gentiles the same. God saves both Jew and Gentile the same way, by faith in Him. All must come to Christ in faith. Ground is level at the foot of the cross. And uh, we see a, a revival Yes, it was a small, it wasn't a national revival, but again, those revival fires at Cornelius' household spread throughout the Gentile world. And Paul would take the gospel, and we, to this day, continue to benefit from that. And may we, in turn, have that same burden of responsibility and have that same zeal and drive to share the gospel with others. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this study tonight. Thank you for Cornelius. Thank you for Peter and for his willingness to go where Many others were afraid to go, but he obeyed you, and he went to the Gentiles. Cornelius and his household got saved, and Lord, we continue to receive the benefit of, as Gentiles, having received the gospel, having been saved. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. May, Lord, we 
be burdened to reach others. And Lord, may our church be effective in presenting the gospel and taking advantage of divine opportunities that you give us. And may we continue to declare the truth of the word of God faithfully and obediently. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Sorry I went a little over, but uh, thank you for your faithfulness.